Hi, my name's Bryn Griffiths. Welcome to the Labour Left podcast. Last time you listened to Liz Davis and she gave you the inside story of Blair's 1990s Labour Party. Our pledge to you on this podcast is to provide reports from key activists on the front line so you can learn how to strengthen your own left wing activity. I can't think of anyone better than Hilary Shan to give us a frontline report this time. Hilary, our guest, is a Labour councillor from Worthing, possibly the most successful Labour group in the country. Somehow, goodness knows how, she also finds time to be the co-chair of Momentum. I asked a good friend of mine, Dave Lowney, about our guest, and he was until recently the chair of Hillary's constituency Labour Party, and he described her thus, the centre of gravity of East Worthing and the Shoreham left. I think we can safely say that Hillary is one of the key figures on the Labour left today. How are you doing, Hillary? I'm good, thank you very much. And thank you to Dave for that as well. <laughs> you, buy, you buy the pipe next time you see it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hillary, let's kick off with a bit about yourself. How did you become a socialist? I hear that your mum, Pat Shan, is an impressive character on the Sussex left. Uh, yeah, she certainly is an impressive, uh, impressive character all round. <laughs> I think you would say <laughs> she's a, um, a nurse and then a midwife. She was in the NHS for 45 years. Um, so, yeah, certainly uh, she's been a big uh, influence in my politics, um, but also my dad as well. I mean, my dad actually was probably the more sort of political um, of the two when I was growing up. He's always had an interest in politics. Um, but I think, you know, what just sort of ran through the two of them really was... Um, uh, just a real sort of deep sense of justice and and social injustice and um and the two of them being immigrants to the country as well my mum's Irish my dad's Canadian they both came here um as kids so they both sort of were a bit united as sort of um you know strangers in a foreign land they met when they were teenagers and have, have been together ever since so um yeah so no they certainly both have been hugely influential in my um in my politics um, but really, it was kind of uh, Jeremy Corbyn um, that sort of uh, solidified that, I suppose, into the socialism that I have now. Yeah. Tell us about this photograph that we've got up on the screen that I think was a, 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 an iconic moment for you about your involvement in the Labour left. Tell us what's it, happening in this picture with your mum, yourself and your dad. Yeah, absolutely. So, um my dad was actually the first one that sort of cottoned on. I said, said he was the one that was always sort of into politics in the family. I was sort of aware and, you know, uh, you know, kept up to date and stuff. But he was the one that in 2015 said, oh, you should really check out this Jeremy Corbyn character. He's just been <laughs> elected leader of the Labour Party. And I was like, so <laughs> you know, I was like thinking, you know, the Labour Party. Oh, God, who wants to get involved in that sort of thing? Um, so he was the first one my dad joined in 2015 when uh, Jeremy first got elected leader. And then my mum joined about six months later. And then I was the last to the party and joined a couple of months after that. So um, in this picture is us at uh, the Brighton Centre at the leadership rally in August 2016. It's the first time we'd ever done anything political as a family. Um, and it was just the most amazing event. I mean, the atmosphere was just incredible. Um, I mean, that's why we were lucky, my generation of people getting into politics, because we thought that's what politics felt like. <laughs> and then uh, then you actually start going to CLP meetings. <laughs> you realise it's not quite that invigorating <laughs> all the time. Um, but no, it was just fantastic. And uh, Jeremy was just uh just so inspirational and um it was just a really lovely moment you know for the three of us to kind of share that um together as well and just really kind of um yeah that's just that sense of hope at the time was was incredible you know what it, it really it always makes me smile when i hear these stories not only because it was just such a fantastic inspiring period but for people like myself and my guest last time liz davis jeremy was just jeremy yeah. When I first got involved in the Labour left in the 1980s, Jeremy used to turn up, at, just as he does now, every fringe meeting, every demonstration, and it, it never occurred to a single one of us that he was going to be the uh, leader of the Labour Party. So it always brings a smile to your face because I, I don't think people of, of your generation realise just how stunned we were. 
No, absolutely. And, and it is amazing because to us, I mean, you still see it even at like the world transformed. Whenever you see him walking around, he's still got that rock star persona amongst the sort of younger left, you know, it's like, oh, my God, it's Jeremy. <laughs> you know? But yeah, I know. I mean, I know loads of people like you. I mean, I know, you know, Dorothy, who's um, an activist locally here, has known him for years. And yeah, I know it's it is funny. I think they always chuckle a bit when uh, we talk of it and like uh, like we do. Although I did get a selfie done within uh, the 22 Labour conference. Oh, it's got to be done, it's got to be done. <laughs> so, um, at the 2023 20, conference, um, the, you know, the last October's conference, um, you carried on that family tradition of defending the NHS. So let's, um, for those visitors, so for those watching on YouTube, you could have a look, and for those on the podcast, you could have a listen. This is what Hillary had to say about the National Health Service. Do you describe Wes's vision for the NHS as light on policy? Yeah, I mean, he has no commitment to ending privatisation of the NHS. And in fact, it looks like he has plans to increase private sector use of the NHS, essentially. We have to remember that within the health system, we are dealing with literally some of the most powerful lobbyists in the world here. This is what that is about. It is about profit. It isn't about people. And as long as we are in a system that prioritises people's health for profit, it's never going to work for these services. User. So it's hugely worrying. Um, and yeah, it's it's obviously completely the wrong direction. Sums up some of the differences that we're seeing and the political differences we're seeing in the Labour Party. What, what memories does that um, clip bring back from this year's conference? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the striking thing about conference this year was just the um, just the visibility of big business and consultants like KPMG and and that kind of thing. And and that clip on Navara actually, which you can see the full thing on them um, uh, on YouTube that Rivka did, um, was kind of really exposing some of them that just said like, you know, why are you here? I'm here to sell stuff. You know, that's that they were literally they were just brazenly saying that, you know, and it was interesting because all of these sort of activist groups were sort of shoved into a corridor in the other building. You know, you had like CND and um, Palatine Solidarity and, you know, all of those kind of activist groups were sort of shoved to one side. And in the big room was all the big business with the press and everything. So, I mean, I've been to every Labour conference now since 2017. Um and just yeah, the, the difference is just um it's really it's really stark. I mean, it's just it's just all suits and big business now. Yeah, and there was that graphic in the the, the handbook for the stallholders, wasn't there, that proudly declared that there was going to be more people from businesses, consultants, and lobbyists, and there was going to be delegates and trade unionists there this year. I thought it was extraordinary that that we should see that as a plus. You know, there's supposed to be a yeah. democratic conference and there was more people there trying to persuade us not to do things to transform society than the world actually talking about how to do it. Absolutely. And I mean, we just saw unprecedented stitch ups, you know, the way they stitched up um, the NHS motions um, so that they sort of filtered them out um, into a different bracket so that they could get all of their NHS fit for the future ones through whilst siphoning mm. off the ones that were um, about public ownership, um, you know, and the leadership overriding the conference arrange com arrangements committee. I mean, as I said, it's, it's kind of unprecedented. So, um, I mean, I was lucky enough not to spend much time at Labour conference this time, actually. <laughs> and so I had quite a positive experience because I was at TWT for the majority of it, which was absolutely fantastic. And interestingly, I thought TWT was much more energized and much more hopeful than last year. Um, mm. And there was kind of a sense of the left needing to get organized again and, and a sense that, you know, there's kind of an inevitability now about Keir Starmer becoming prime minister. Um, but what is going to happen when he gets in and, you know, there's it, the status quo prevails kind of thing. Um, and that that being an, an opportunity, basically, for the left to to be there to make the argument. So I thought that was interesting that TWT felt um, it felt a lot more positive and energised than, than last year. I think that's true. I, I was um, at TWT, the World Transformed, this year, and I was getting all these WhatsApp messages from my comrades at home saying, oh, gosh, it's terrible. And myself and Lorcan Whitehead, who's the secretary of um, Momentum, we were messaging back saying, well, actually, we're not seeing much of the conference, but the world transformed is the, like, 
the most inspirational sort of, you know, building your confidence back up again moment of the year. It was it was quite a paradox, really, that those of us in Liverpool seemed a damn sight happier than those at home watching it on the telly. So true. Yeah. I mean, last year I spent way too much time in the conference hall and came away completely sort of down and just really, really unmotivated. And this year, uh, yeah, I felt completely different. I felt really uplifted. Um, saw some fantastic uh, talks at TWT um, and yeah I completely agree with you it was brilliant and um, we Momentum held a couple of um, sessions one on the Labour what does the Labour left look like under a Starmer government basically mm-hmm. and one about uh, the left in local government as well which is obviously um, fan- some fantastic success stories there so yeah really just kind of honing in on um, you know where we have had successes and where we can in the future I think. Yeah, I think that I think that's right. It was uh, it was great, and also I think that to defend momentum in in the conference itself. When I went in twenty twenty two, I saw, you know, for people that aren't members of momentum, I think momentum really comes into its own at conference, because to actually understand, I'm a bit of an old sort of activist, so I've been to the conference meetings and and I know how the conference works. But if you haven't got a group behind you that understands what's happening at the pre-meeting that the region organises and then what happens in the composite meeting and what the Labour leadership's trying to get excluded from the composite and how the um, prioritisation of the ballot occurs. If you're not completely on it, you haven't got a chance. And for me, having momentum behind me, feeding me all the information about what was going on, it was... To me, it's the most invaluable I've ever seen momentum when I was a conference delegate. I really needed you and it was fantastic. Mm. That's brilliant to hear because I think that's one of the things that I always say about momentum. And, you know, I know sometimes, you know, in the political moment that we're in, it's pretty tough, obviously, for all of us. And people, you know, sometimes sort of question, oh, you know, what's momentum for anymore? Blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the the thing I always say is that, look, we're still the biggest socialist campaign organisation in the country. And we are the only organisation that is doing that organising of the Labour left. You know, if that goes away, nobody's doing that stuff. And quite frankly, the old guard of the party thrived on that lack of knowledge of new activists. You know, when we all came in under Jeremy Corbyn, I mean, Momentum did the same for me. I mean, they literally wrote a guide to CLPs, you know, because we rocked up at CLP meetings and you've got no idea about standing orders and you know, the rule book and what officers can do what and, you know, blah, 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 you know. So um, and Momentum did literally like politically educate a generation of people about how to be an activist in the Labour Party. Um, you know, so they were totally invaluable. And, um, you know, and obviously I wasn't um, on the exec now, then, but now being co-chair, that's what my passion really is with Momentum is that we still um, deliver that especially for young activists you know and allow them that space to understand the structures of the Labour Party and succeed within it whilst also fostering their own uh, passion and activism outside of um, the Labour Party as well. And what an asset the councillors group is because to become a councillor you're entering into a new world. We'll touch on what that new world sometimes mm. <laughs> looks like later, but you're entering into such a new world. I worked in local government for years and new councillors, they really struggle because it's just, it's such a new place. And not only is it a difficult place to suddenly become active, if you're a socialist, you've got so much pressure on you to sort of moderate yeah. and become respectable. Yeah. And I, I've, I've spoken to some of the people in the councillors network that Momentum runs, and it's so valuable that those new councillors get to speak to people across the length of the country, get advice, share experiences, really, really useful stuff, I think. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's been invaluable. I mean, because as I said, you know, I I know we'll touch on it later, but being elected as a councillor this year, um, you know, and having been involved in politics, involved in the Labour Party for the last um, six years or whatever, it's still a completely new challenge being being a councillor. You're completely right. Mm. Those dynamics are um, are completely different from the CLP or or anything else. So, yeah, no, the Momentum Councillors Network is, is absolutely invaluable. Definitely. So you're the co-chair, Hillary, of Momentum. So tell us a bit more about what that involves. What's your role? What do you do? And how did you get to be it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, I said, I think I said to you before, I still don't know how I got to be it, but I see, <laughs> but it seems to have happened, and, and here it is. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been the momentum activist basically since I joined the Labour Party. I mm -hmm. joined momentum uh, almost immediately, uh, as obviously it was the the organisation behind Jeremy. Um, so I've always been really involved in in momentum. And then um, I was asked to stand for the national coordinating group um, last year in 2022, um, and so was elected as the southeast rep, uh, basically on on the NCG. Um, and then was elected uh, as one of the co-chairs as well. So that's, um, I mean, it's been an absolute roller coaster. I mean, it's amazing, really, um, to see the inner workings of Momentum is what I found the most interesting, um, you know, because it's got a really significant staff team. You know, we've still got uh, well over 10 members of staff. Um, and, you know, just seeing the political organising that goes on, the organising team, we've got this campaign and activist development team who are um, constantly working with sort of socialist organisers of the future, putting them through future councillors programmes. We have a Leo Panich leadership programme. We also have an incredible comms team. I mean, often if you ever see a story in The Guardian or anything like that, that's actually critical of the uh, Labour leadership in any way or any sort of like bits of information, that's often often come from Momentum's comms team, you know, that kind of is working to 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 really try and pull the other side of the story in somehow, you know, um, against the sort of wave of of uh, the right wing media. So, yeah, it's been um, it's been incredible. They're, they're an amazing staff team. I've got so much respect for them. Um, and yeah, being co-chair has really obviously been about um, leading the NCG and, and talking about our strategy and how we move forward. Um, and implementing that with uh, the staff team. And, you know, of course, we've had some big things happen in that time, um, you know, responding uh, to Diana, but lead losing the whip this year, for example, the ongoing situation uh, with Jeremy um, seemingly being uh, not allowed to stand as a, a Labour MP. Um, so, you know, there's been some really interesting things happen in that time. And um, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been great to be a part of it. And, and just to kind of get the opportunity to um, vocalise our arguments on the left uh, in, you know, being able to go on politics live, for example, during conference and, and that kind of stuff. It kind of lends the opportunity for me and other NCG members as well who do great stuff on, on media to, um, yeah, just to get our point of view across, which is not often heard in the mainstream media, let's face it. Well, let's let's have a listen at, at you, Hilary, put, getting, very much getting your view across um, after Labour Party conference this year, I think that the importance of people such as yourself in the leadership and momentum going on the television and articulating what so many of us are thinking in the constituencies is so, so important. Let's have a watch and a listen. Absolutely right to point out that, of course, Stam was elected on a manifesto promising nationalisation and many of the other policies we at Momentum continue to champion. And the reality is that the transformation of Labour is more about an increased proximity to big business and away from mass membership and, and democracy. But, you know, he was right to say that after the mess that the Tories are going to leave this country in, uh, that we need re national renewal. But the reality is we're in a social crisis and to fix that needs cold, hard cash. And so so there was a real lack of um, commitment to proper funding of the NHS, for example. There was a lack of detail uh, on the housing, council housing, and how that will be afforded. Local government is in desperate need of money. Uh, we need high minimum wage, free school meals. You know, I could go on. Um, he would say growth, Hillary, growth will pay for it. Yeah, but vague promises of a, of a magic growth tree are, are not going to cut it. And the reality is when they get into government, people are going to expect change. And if they don't commit to some real proper investment in this country, which, as I said, requires cold, hard cash at the end of the day, they're going to come unstuck very quickly. And he really, really is in danger of undermining his own prospects here. The manifest he was in the shadow cabinet when we released those manifestos in 27 2019 starmer himself called them foundational um so you're absolutely right to question that um and it does re really raise the question of what are we really going to get from a starmer government well can you get more of what you want in other words can momentum continue to exercise power can the left we talked to john mcdonald yesterday exercise power when labor's in government if labor's in government 
Absolutely. I mean, I think the um, the hope is, you know, we all do hope for a Labour government. We desperately need it after the uh, mess that the Tories will have left this in. But as I said, people will be expecting change. And so we will continue okay. to fight for the policies that we know uh, will get that change. I think that's that's great. I, I love that phrase, the, the magic growth tree. <laughs> and we, we seem to have gone from... Um, Possibly, our, yeah, probably our most successful manifesto in 2017, um, where John McDonnell had a costed um, program that was going to make a real difference to the people of this country. And, and, and people saying, oh, there's no magic money tree when we had a costed program. To now, it all seems to be on the wing and a prayer that growth will magically fund everything. I just, I just don't believe it. I just don't no. believe it. Absolutely, I completely agree. And just, I mean, that speech of Starmer's was just, it was so bizarre because it, it seemed to land very well with a lot of people. But to me, I just thought it was like a sort of economic word soup. It was just sort of like, you know, just these kind of buzzwords all the time. But it's like, you know, you can't, you can't just say, oh, we're going to build this many homes if you've got absolutely no detail on what kind of homes, who's going to pay for them, you know, who's going to be building them, <laughs> you know, all of that stuff. It's just like, it's so, la it's so frustratingly lacking in detail um, that it's just, you know, amounts to a kind of PR exercise. And I think the most frustrating thing about it, like you said, you sort of n hit the nail on the head there, where it's like, the um, standards are just so different, aren't they? You know, when it was a socialist left-wing manifesto, it was absolutely torn apart as, you know, this isn't costly, there's no money, there's no this, there's no that, you know, and he's a threat to national security and like, all of this stuff. <laughs> and then remarkably, when Starmer comes out with this completely like low on detail um, sort of grounds for a manifesto all of a sudden you know we don't need to look too closely at it it'll just you know be growth and that'll that'll fix it all so it's um yeah just the, the it's so hypocritical the the standards that the left are are held to are just they're just so different absolutely absolutely well, we've had a good look at um what momentum's doing nationally but i think one of the things that momentum's been doing extremely well is it's turned towards local government and at the start, I, I bigged up your Worthing Labour group <laughs> as one of the most successful Labour um, groups in the country. And here's why. Worthing went from zero councillors in 2017 to 24 councillors. And then in 2022, you seized control of Worthing Council. And in 23, you joined the Labour group. Hillary? How on earth did Worthing Labour Party pull off a minor miracle and deliver that political earthquake? I used to live down the coast in Brighton in the 1980s, and I thought Worthing was the last place on the planet that would ever go Labour. So what happened? Yeah, I know. It's amazing, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, frankly, I mean, one of the, the, the biggest factors, of course, was um, in 2015-16, the influx of activists. I mean, I think... Um, you know, I mean, people do say there's been some demographic change. Of course, there has. There's been a, a drift, you know, sort of along the coast from Brighton. Um, but, you know, I think over the years, we've seen that some of these results have not been landslides. They've been, you know, pretty tight. And so without the activists to get that vote out, it just wouldn't have, you know, it just wouldn't have happened. Um, and so what happened was when we got that influx of members and activists under Jeremy, it allowed there to be such presence and such a ground operation that we were able to get a Labour vote out um, for the first time, essentially one that may well have been there. You know, we were very typical, one of those places that people saw there'd been a Lib Dem council in the past. So people voted Lib Dem tactically. Oh, Labour can never win here, et cetera, et cetera. So when we were able to get out that effective ground operation and elect Becky Cooper, who's now leader of um, Worthing Council as our first uh, in 40 years, People then thought, oh, Labour can win here, you know, and then it's mm. kind of a ripple effect, isn't it? That once you kind of can, if you can just kind of secure that one victory, um, you can argue that that Labour can win. And then it was just, um, yeah, a kind of a, an, a domino effect um, after that, really. But I think as well, though, like the really sort of special thing I think that happened here was the way that activists were embedded in the community and this came back to 
um, under Jeremy, there were um, the community organizer roles um, that were Labour Party staff. And um, we had Charlotte Gerard before before my time in, um, in Worthing, before I moved back here. Um, but Charlotte really uh, built up that sort of confidence of community activism here. And, um, you know, you kind of saw during the pandemic that a lot of uh, Labour members and councillors were setting up the mutual aid groups. They set up um, a food bank. Uh, you know, my mum, for example, does the uniform exchange and has now now runs a, a community hub with Councillor Margaret Howard as well. Um, and that was so, you know, in, in Ada as well, you had um, people setting up um, community cafes. And so we really kind of the activists here really grew in confidence in that community activism and became really embedded. And of course, what happens then is that it's the same people that are sorting out somebody's electricity or delivering their prescriptions or delivering their food that then knocks on the door and asks for their vote for Labour. And it really just changed the conversation a lot of the time um, because there was so many people that were so embedded in so many different ways in the community. Um, and I think it allowed us to show that sort of socialism in action um, that then trans started to translate to um, to votes and also showed people that we can also make a difference in opposition. You don't actually have to be in power like socialists can and do make a difference on the ground in our communities without those levers of power. Um, but then undeniably, once you do get um, that power, then you are able to make um, an even bigger difference because you do have access to to things that you don't when you're in, in opposition. I wonder whether because you didn't have a Labour group at the start and the Labour groups can be with a small c, the more conservative component of a local Labour party. I wonder whether the, if there was this influx of new members into the party under Jeremy, whether they were sort of unleashed in a way they might not have been if you'd had a modest sized labor group when you started yeah that's really interesting i think i think that that may well be true but i think also what sort of happened what's nice about not having um, a labor group to start with is that it's grown so organically yeah. so it's kind of you know you've had becky who i said obviously now leads the council was sort of the first one in there and then you sort of had a group of another three kind of joined who were really sort of um, active at the time joined by another three and and that's kept sort of going to the point now as i say 24 of us and some of those people have been there since sort of 2015, 16, or were members way, way before that, you know, have been members for, for years. And then you've got some people that have only kind of moved to the area or got involved in the last couple of years. So it's been a very organic sort of growing group that sort of felt like it's grown together um, in a lot of ways and has so, had to support each other. So you get all these councillors elected. And you arrive in the council chamber. And I was reading a Labour List article that I think yourself, Liz Nicholson and Carl Walker wrote together. And you describe the scene when you get into the council chamber as sprawling, lifeless council meetings that make members of the public feel like drunk gate crashes at a party full of dull aliens. <laughs> I worked in local government for 30 years, so I could sort of recognise this picture. But I'm really intrigued to know what did you do differently when you you broke your way into the council chamber, as it were? Yeah, I mean, this, I, as I said, I have to um, give credit to those that kind of um, were there at that time, because uh, so I, I'm from Worthing um, and I was in mid Sussex for uh, quite a long time. And then I moved back here in 2020. So um, but the Labour group um, that sort of came in. Uh, to power I mean they the work that they did was absolutely incredible I mean they um, for you know two years beforehand were building their plan for you know that they, they didn't sort of arrive and think oh right now what you know they walk mm. straight in the door uh, of the town hall with um, a plan of what they were going to do and um, strategized in groups in all the different areas that we were going to have to work on about what our priorities were going to be and how we were going to deliver it they were talking to officers in the council um you know they, they were uh just incredibly well prepared and worked incredibly hard and then when i, I was down here when uh, we did take the council and i kind of um took that, that must have been um, some night 
Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, but we had sort of, you know, that massive strategy document that they um, had written over those two years. And my sort of professional work is in, in marketing and communication. So I just condensed it right down into uh, a manifesto called a council for the community in order to make that something that the public could actually digest and understand and um, for it to be in language that made sense and not I saw something about jargon. 10 pledges you had. Yeah, exactly. And um, we tried to make those really resonate with the public in terms of what they actually want from their town, whether that's environmental, you know, housing, uh, culture and leisure being a, a massive part of that as well. Um, and so, yeah, the, um, but the sort of in terms of what we did and have done differently, it has really been about bringing the council in. So um, we uh, ran the Big Listen campaign in the first year, and that was literally going out onto uh, the streets in all different parts of Worthing, all different areas. Um, and councillors just listening and taking notes from people, asking them how they felt about the town, what do they want from the town, um, and that literally feeding our strategy. Um, and sometimes they, we kind of had planned to do things and actually getting out and listening to people, they didn't particularly agree and that's fine you know and so we mm. kind of had to had to change um direction a little bit um but now as well you know we um hold meetings outside of the town hall we go into community centers we had a really fantastically um attended one just a couple of weeks ago um where lots of the general public were there you know so it's it's just about trying to bring politics into the community instead of it being this sort of yeah. really intimidating sort of unrelatable thing in the town hall which you know the town hall is basically like designed to make people feel uncomfortable mm. you know um so yeah so it's it's really just about working with those community groups and i mean the um the biggest one of the biggest success stories that we've just had which i think really encapsulates everything is that um carl walker who's the um deputy leader of worthing council um recently redeveloped the um he redesigned the community infrastructure levy um for the town which for those that don't know is basically the money that is paid by developers to the council in order to kind of you know improve the local area kind of um yeah you know stem the sort of like uh changes that come from uh developments negative um changes that might come about and beforehand that was just kind of um very just... office -led. I, I used to work in Platon, and, and yeah. that document would usually be very very sort of professionalized document written by officers that the members just sort of nodded through in my experience mm. absolutely and that was very much the way of um the conservative administration that came before us to be honest in 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 pretty much everything but what um carl did was completely uh redesign it over a few months where we held um meetings within the community um where community groups could come along learn about the community infrastructure levy and then actually apply for funding um mm, and brilliant. what that meant was so it was from really from the bottom up so we were learning what groups there were in the community what they were doing and what they needed money for and what they wanted to be doing and that's just resulted in i think it's nearly seven hundred thousand pounds going to nearly 60 community groups uh, and that's everything from uh, food banks to young people's mental health groups um sensory playgrounds for sen kids um, um you know it's a there was a, a choir that was a gospel choir doing black history month events it's been absolutely amazing and we just held um, a celebration event in the town hall for um all the groups that got funding last week and it was just absolutely fantastic it was brilliant and i think that just absolutely encapsulates the difference between what went before and this administration that's a really fantastic optimistic story and Hillary it sounds a bit too good to be true and I fear the next bit of this podcast is going to suggest that it was you were incredibly optimistic and you were ready to march on Westminster and not only make history by seizing the council you were going to be involved in winning the seats for Worthing what went wrong yes unfortunately the Labour machine got to us I think we always 
Worthing, we always felt like we were in a bit of a bubble. Maybe we were a bit untouchable. Um, and uh, we got a bit of a crash down to earth in the last few weeks as the Labour machine came in and blocked all of our um, local councillors that had applied for parliamentary, the parliamentary seat in East Worthing and Shoreham. Um, and uh, none of them were allowed to stand. And uh, so we ended up with a short list of four uh, people that nobody um, had known for um, before a few so months ago. So we've got ago. this fantastic situation where you've gone from zero councillors to taking control of Worthing. You've, in, in terms of electoralism, you've probably got the most successful Labour group in the country. And they couldn't. And so Carl Walker wasn't good enough. Kat Ar Arnold wasn't good enough. Is there any Worthing councillor on the shortlist? No, it's four people who, none of them are from here. Uh, so there are no local members, let alone councillors. Uh, so they're all outsiders and none of us had uh, ever met them before um, a few months ago, basically when the parliamentary selection was kind of on the horizon. It sounds like everything you've described. I think if, if the average Labour Party member listened to you describing what you'd achieved in Worthing, how you transform the way Labour branches work, how you transformed how a Labour group works, the electoral success they you'd had. Even if they weren't from your wing of the party, they'd be thinking, that's fantastic. You know, yeah. it, it's almost like the, the Labour officials saw that as a threat. It's It's genuinely hard to say because I think what shocked us was that, I mean, Carl has always been associated with the left. We know that. Um, and we've seen the pattern of um, left wing candidates being blocked from standing. So in a sense, it was devastating um, because we just hoped that it would be different because of what we've done, what we've achieved, what he's done and achieved, um, but not surprising as such. I think the more surprising one was Kat Arnold, who is... Um, not associated with the left or any faction particularly hard-working well-respected well-liked local councillor in ada um and even she was kept off um of the shortlist and so it i think the takeaway is that this is not even just about left versus right anymore this is about them installing the exact person that fits the bill that will be the yes man and it is pretty much always a white man that comes out on top in this process at the moment and I think it's not even just about the um, isolation of the left although that is a factor but it's just incredible the kind of army of sort of cookie cutter starmerites that they want uh, to make up this next government um, and what it's saying to people, um, you know, when you're looking at the shortlist as well, I mean, the amount of tokenism that is going on here, it's really obvious when you've got two, a sort of apparent two horse race between two white men and what feels like a token ethnic minority candidate and a token woman. Um, and you can just see it in the way that the campaigns are being run, that there is a machine behind certain candidates um, and also apparent due diligence done on some very much more so than others with, you know, other uh, candidates managing to make it through with some um, pretty shocking views on things. Um that it's just looking more and more just like a, a, an utter, utter stitch up on all fronts. Um, and so that I, even I have been shocked at um, the extent to which they will go to just install their guy, basically. I was a very I, I occasionally go to the Lewis Labour Party political education events. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the sort of um, big things is pluralism on the left. Yeah. They say that all views should be heard and the Labour Party should be campaigning, should be rooted in the community, and there should be a plurality of ideas. And they pride themselves on that exchange. So there's a space for us, but there's also a space for people way to our right. And I think that's what a healthy Labour Party should be. And I think people are realising now, especially with what happened with the, um, the Compass supporter recently, that this isn't just about bashing the lefties. 
this is becoming a really narrow conception of what the Labour Party is, one that I don't like. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the saddest things about what's happened locally for me, actually. And it was quite um, emotional sort of preparing for this and thinking about sort of the history and what we've achieved over the last few years. Because one of the things about this group of people across um, our CLP and, and in the Labour group in Worthing as well, has been an openness to pluralism. And I think one of the things that has allowed us the success that we've had has been genuine unity. We mm. have genuinely worked together as those of us that are really openly on the left, those that are very openly on the right of the party and everybody in between, factional, non-factional, whatever it may be, because we've always focused on our common goal, which has always been to change our communities and do the right thing. Um, and I think that's one of the saddest things about what's happened with this is that it has caused such rifts and divisions um, so unnecessarily. And um, yeah, it's I think it's it's changed things, um, certainly mm. for the current moment anyway. Um, How's the feeling in, in the party? Because I've, I've got friends, as you know, in the Worthing area, and it's been such mm. a fantastic story. They're not going to break that, are they? Have you, as 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 the left and the Worthing Labour Party got the resilience to forge on, or how how has it landed in the local party? I think so. I think we will. I think we'll recover and we'll we will move on because at the end of the day, we're you know we're socialists and we want to we want to make a difference. You know, we want to continue the good work that we're doing in the council. We wouldn't want to jeopardize that. Um, but I think the Labour Party have made a rod for their own back, quite frankly, in um, East Worthing and Shoreham, um, because they are going to find it incredibly hard to get the activists out who are disillusioned, who are angry, but also who don't have a connection to an outside candidate that they've never met, know nothing about. And of course, they are angry that they'd never had the chance uh, to choose a local candidate over one of these outsiders. And so it's going to be, I think, considering how desperately they need to win this seat in order to have a Labour majority, they just made it a hell of a lot harder. Mm. Uh, before we move on to, to Palestine, which we must discuss, I think I can probably say on the on behalf of the vast majority of the people that are watching this podcast, you know, solidarity to all the left and indeed the whole of the Worthing Labour Party. You, you've you've achieved fantastic things. And uh, I think up and down the length of the country, there's people watching that are, are, are really sort of behind you and want to show their solidarity. So you know, I'm not sure how much that helps, but I'm sure that, that the feeling of love and solidarity is, is there uh, yeah, around the country. You. Anyway, Palestine. Hillary, we've rightly talked about your local party's amazing achievements and the damage of the selection debacle. But I think we must turn to Palestine. Um, we must talk about it because I think it's the most important issue facing, you know, not just the Labour Party, but the world today. You know, what, what happened with the, the Hamas massacre and the history that led to the Hamas massacre of innocent Israeli civilians and, and now the horrific bombing, which as we speak, has paused for a moment as the hostages are released. Um, more than 10,000, you know, every time I look at the figure, it's more horrific and um, upsetting. Uh, so more than 10,000 have died. Can you just sketch for us, Hillary, what, what is momentum stance? What are we saying about what's happening in Gaza at the moment? I mean, momentum stance is just completely clear. It's we support an unequivocal immediate ceasefire. I mean, it is the only way that we can possibly stop the bloodshed that is happening and the violence. Uh, you know, it, it, we have to continue to argue for that. I mean, it has been an incredibly difficult and frustrating time to be a Labour Party member, a Labour councillor. We see the hurt in our communities, our Jewish communities, our Muslim communities, um, and yeah, it's been an incredibly tough thing to bear to not see the Labour leadership um, side with, I think it's 79% of Labour voters, you know, our Muslim voters uh, are leaving us in droves um, and feel let down. Um, people want to see an end to the violence. Um, and, you know, we, we just 
yeah, at Momentum, that is, we're unequivocal about that. I saw Zara, Zara Sultana MP discussing this with Ash Sarkar, and Ash asked her, how did she feel about the Labour Party not calling for a ceasefire? How disappointed was she? And I thought what she said was really interesting, and I really related to it. She said that when she went into the lobbies, she was really surprised how many people were walking through with her calling for the ceasefire, and that there were people there that weren't the usual suspects, and the left, and it went beyond the left. And I think it's a real tribute to every Labour Party member that's been pushing so hard, and every council Labour group that's been pushing so hard for a ceasefire. I think it's a real tribute that we got as many Labour MPs as we did to vote for that ceasefire. So maybe it's the the beginnings of what we might expect under a Starmer government. I, I, I wonder whether the Labour Party still isn't quite as stone up as Keir thinks it might be. Mm. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think, but the thing is, is that with this, uh, it's again, you know, it's not about sort of right and left, is it? It's about humanity. And, you know, to reduce that vote in Parliament to sort of a, well, you're going to vote with the SNP or not. You know, it's not about siding with the SNP. It's about siding with humanity. Like, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. vote with your conscience, not your political allegiance, you know. Um, and so what we've seen in the membership and uh, in Labour groups as well is, again, this has crossed both all sides of the Labour Party, you know, uh, all um of all political persuasions in in Labour, CLPs and, and groups, because um, people are united in wanting to see an end to this. Um, and it's just been incredibly frustrating to see the leadership kowtow to basically the likes of the Tory government and also the US government. Let's, you know, be honest about that um, in terms of their, their position. But I think it has been heartening um, to see... Uh, some softening of the position because of the strength of feeling within the party, um, which doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, so yes, it has felt a little bit like maybe Labour Party democracy hasn't quite uh, gone away yet. But as I said, you know, I think if, uh, you know, anything can show that uh, a reason to abandon um, you know, political allegiances. It's something like this, where it's you know, Absolutely. as I said, it's it's just got to be about um, about ending the violence. I understand Mish Rahman, one of the um, national uh, the NCG members of Momentum, has got an initiative to try and mobilise Labour Party members. To support yeah, the ceasefire. absolutely. So um, Mish is, uh, is our vice chair and he's also on the Labour National Executive Committee. Um, so uh, Mish has got a campaign, Labour for a ceasefire. Um, so, yeah, definitely do um, check that out and sign um, the petition. And also uh, Momentum have got a, uh, a lobbying tool as well where you can write um, to your Labour MP if you have one or if not, Keir Starmer. Um, and we've had thousands of people um, using that lobbying tool so far. So, um, yeah, please do go and check that out. And, um, yeah, just continue to, to build that pressure. And find out about your local activities because they're happening around the country. And Absolutely. when there's those national demonstrations, get yourself up to London. Absolutely. This, this, is, this is a big moment, isn't it? And I read one piece that I thought was really powerful that said there's going to be a ceasefire. And hopefully the pause it may, might be the beginning of that. Let's see what the campaigning and what the demonstrations and what the protests will help determine is how early that ceasefire happens. Yeah. Yeah. And so if we're quiet and we just say we've got to support the Israeli government, it goes on for longer. If we mm. get out on the streets, if we lobby, if we write those letters, if we protest, if we go to our local MP surgeries, if we go to our local council meetings, and if we do that, not just in Britain, throughout the world, that's what brings the ceasefire closer, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It really, really yeah. matters. It really, really matters. I couldn't agree more. And I think just, um, yeah, continuing that uh, momentum, so to speak, um, and and continuing uh, that wave of support and, and just vocalisation um, is just so important because um, hopefully there will be a ceasefire um, soon and hopefully this will be the start of that. Um, and I hope that uh, however that is brokered, and I mean, at the moment, you know, this pause is being brokered by Qatar 
And, mm. um, you know, I hope that the leadership of this country and our party and the US will hang their heads in shame for not having played uh, sure. a part in that. I couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't agree with you more, Hillary. And um, I've had mixed feelings over the last few weeks. I think at, at, at various moments I've felt absolute shame about my Labour Party card and what Keir Starmer has been saying on my behalf. But also, I've been very, very happy indeed to be a supporter of momentum within the Labour Party. I think that makes a real difference. It allows us to put that case for ceasefire and and and, and still be able to hold our Labour Party card with a degree of pride because we know that the Labour left playing such a leading role in the campaign. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, um, you know, that's exactly, you know, what we are. We're still here. We're still a home for uh, the Labour left. And um, hopefully we do um, offer uh, that opposition and that chance for people to feel that their voice can still be heard on the left of the party. Yeah. Anyway, we have our feature that we have at the end of every podcast. I used to be involved in a, a Labour Left magazine in the 1990s and the 1980s. And we used to have a feature, a slightly satirical column known as the class traitor of the month. When I started this podcast, I decided it would be too easy to do that because there would just be so much material to go at. So we thought that we'd try and do something different. We thought this time we'd go for the class hero of the month. So each time we have a guest, we ask who is going to be the Labour Left podcast class hero of the month and what did they deserve, do to deserve our accolade. So, Hilary, who's your class hero of the month? <laughs> My class hero of the month is John Bain, otherwise known as Attila the Stockbroker, a uh, punk <laughs> poet who has been, uh, yeah, he's been uh, on the scene for decades now, uh, quite literally fighting uh, fascists <laughs> at, some, <laughs> at some points of his career. Um, but he's also, uh, he's a local activist here um, and his wife is a local councillor in, in Ada as well. And he's been a fantastic um, support to myself and um, to Carl as well. And, and a huge advocate. He's obviously got a, a big audience, a big following. And he's been a huge advocate for the work that we've done locally. Um, and John is, um, he's, he's so determined in his fight to just get the Tories out that whenever we have these kind of darker moments where you think oh god you know what am I doing you know and this local selection has been an example of that but John will always bring it back to that we have to unite we have to get together and we have to get the Tories out we cannot allow them to continue in government um but he is uh, an absolute uh stalwart of the left um, and uh, he was a huge Jeremy Corbyn uh, supporter, you know, uh, performed at rallies for Jeremy. And um, he's, uh, yeah, he's he's fantastic. And um, if you haven't heard him, then check him out definitely on YouTube. And I highly recommend listening to uh, the poem Corbyn Supporters from Hell. Us, we're the skirts of the land, with Jeremy Corbyn's favourite band. We all eat babies and we're commies too. And we've all got AIDS and we'll give it to you with scaly tails and horns and hooves. We undermine everything that moves. You can read about us in the right wing press, the Sun, the Mail and the Express. But don't mess with us, because we're lefties and we smell. <laughs> we're the Corbyn supporters from hell. If your team goes wrong or your car won't start, you can bet your life we played our part. If your team doesn't win or you miss the bus, 10 to 1, it's all down to us. If a dog runs off with your copy of the sun and brings it back with the crossword done. If your pet hamster wakes up dead or you find a squatter in your bed, we did it! And everything else as well, because we're Corbyn supporters from hell. We made your pub serve proper beer. We ban those broadcasts of Top Gear. We're all pacifists, Muslims, gay, and members of the IRA. We bring in asylum seekers and make you pay for their new sneakers. We won't sing songs for the Queen. We think X Factor is obscene. But don't mess with us, because we're lefties and we smell. We're the Corbyn supporters from hell! Cheers! <laughs>
Thanks everyone for watching the Labour Left podcast. The podcast was brought to you in association with Labour Hub, the excellent left-wing news site, which gives you the very best in news from the class struggle frontline. You can find us on the web at labourhub.org.uk. That's labourhub.org.uk. I hope you'll take a look. I'm Bryn Griffiths, the presenter, and our editor is Luke Robinson. We're both active in North Essex in both Momentum and The World Transformed. Before we finish, I'd like to thank you for all your feedback in response to our first podcast with the Labour left activist Liz Davis. Thanks first to Jeremy Gilbert, who described the podcast as a valuable resource to the Labour left. If you haven't listened to Jeremy's podcast, I urge you to have a look. Go to your favourite pro provider and look him up. He's brilliant. Secondly, I'd also like to thank Andrew Fisher, Jeremy Corbyn's former director of policy, who urged us all to watch the podcast on his way to the October Labour Party conference. Thanks, Andrew. Fenola Brophy, who worked alongside Liz Davis, fed back that it was a real honour to contribute to this powerful podcast. I think both Liz and I would agree that the honour, Fenola, was all ours. The last comment goes to Pete Furman, who reported that our Glastonbury clip with Jeremy Corbyn had him welling up about the hope inspired at that time and the hope Starmer and his friends are determined to destroy. Me too, Pete. I'm sure we both agree that the point is not to mourn, but to organise. And I hope that the Labour Left podcast can continue to play a role in that important task. Finally, if you're enjoying the podcast, if you're enjoying the Labour Left podcast, please give us a like, give us a follow, share it with your friends. Each time someone does that, it helps with the algorithms and pushes our show towards people um, that I hope will want to watch. So thanks for your support so far and keep it up. Share, follow and like. Finally, just think about it. Each time you help promote our podcast and all the other excellent Labour Left podcasts on the market, you're helping challenging the, the grip of the legacy media. You're beginning to give other voices a say, so please do it. So, see you next time.